It's America's number one killer, but people don't seem to be too afraid of it. 70 million Americans live with some form of heart disease and almost a million die from it each year. It impacts women much worse than men. What you need to know about heart disease and how to prevent it, next on Living Smart. Welcome to Living Smart, the show designed to help you get the most out of life. Dr. Stephanie Coulter realized in medical school women's heart disease is often ignored by primary care physicians, emergency room staff, and women themselves. The symptoms are different, and unfortunately, the consequences of heart disease in women are more deadly than in men. But this disease kills more Americans than any other, and yet we don't rank too well compared to other industrialized nations in preventing it. We don't exercise enough, eat healthy diets, or keep our blood pressure or sugar levels down. So Dr. Coulter, the medical leader for the Texas Heart Institute Center for Women's Heart, and cardiovascular health disease is here to make us more conscious of the number one killer in America. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And you know, I, I think there's a lot of myths about heart disease. We tend to think men die more, you know, of, of heart disease more than women, and yet it is women who suffer the most from heart disease. It's true. In the last year, we had really good statistics for heart disease deaths. Um, 433,000 women died of heart disease and about 397,000 men. Okay, so it's so, almost a million. Yeah, it's almost a million. And right now in our society, you know, 81 million Americans are living with cardiovascular disease. That's amazing. It's staggering. And, you, you know, it's about a million died here because there's also young people who die of heart disease. Tell me about those statistics. So we mm -hmm. expect them to be older, but there's a lot of young people dying well, of it. Well, one of the scariest statistics is that 150,000 Americans died last year of cardiovascular disease in the age group under 65 years of age. So young people get it, too. Why is it, though, that it affects women worse than men? What is it about women that makes us more susceptible to heart disease? Well, we're not more susceptible. Women get heart disease just like men, which is really one of the myths that we're trying to dispel because, in fact, it had always been considered to be a man's disease because, in fact, historically, men got heart disease 10 years before women did. Okay, so they get it younger. So they get it younger, and that gets a lot of attention because when you're a father of four and you, and you drop die over suddenly, right. at the baseball game, people are going to remember that. Right. And women tended to get it in the more older age groups, and that was kind of just expected. You right. Know? Right. Um, women live longer. So the longer you live, the longer you're going to have the higher incidence of heart disease, yeah. To be able to have heart disease. So I think that's really the major indicator. Mostly, women don't get heart disease until they go through menopause. In fact, at menopause, the risk factors for women markedly increase. And so it takes a while for the risk factors of heart disease to cause disease. And so women tend to get it in their 60s, 70s, and 80s, whereas men typically would show up with heart disease in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. Okay. Are they catching up, or are things changing? Or no? Actually, we've had a dramatic decline in cardiovascular deaths since the 1950s. And what happened in the 50s? Well, the Framingham Heart Study came along, which demonstrated what were the major risk factors for heart disease. And they targeted men early on to keep men from smoking. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. And it was huge in the numbers of um, deaths that were decreasing, particularly in men. So in, fa in fact, the rates of cardiovascular death in males declined since we started keeping statistics since the 1960s. The females didn't get the message until much later. Right. And so their rates of decline in death started to keep pace with men really in the mid-80s. In the last decade, from the year 2000 to the year 2010, since we're sitting at 2011 right. now, we've just passed a decade of the new millennium, and in that decade, the cardiovascular death rate in America declined in men by 22% and in women by 23%, which is huge numbers. Right. And what, what do you think the cause of that was? Well, the main cause is that there are three main things. One, the smoking rates have right. declined 
considerably. Okay. At this point, about 20% of Americans still smoke. Right. But that's down from 40-something percent. So a 20-something reduction in smoking in America corresponded to a 40% reduction in death. Okay, so I mean, that, we know so that's So smoking is big. Right. Um, the second thing that happened is we started doing a much better job at preventing the consequences of high blood pressure. People go to the doctor more. They get their blood pressure checked. And what else do we have? We have way better medicines for blood for pressure blood control pressure, right. that, that don't leave you with good blood pressure and terrible side effects. Right, right. So the, the drugs are good. Yeah. They may be too expensive. Many people can't afford them. Right. But they're still pretty good. And the third thing that happened in the last decade is that uniformly um, doctors are screening people for high cholesterol. And Sooner. Yes. And in the 45 to 65-year-old age group, um, men and women are taking cholesterol-reducing medicines in, in many groups up to 65% of the population. That's, that's really high. Let's talk about the, some of the basics. Let's start with the basics and how does the heart work? Tell me about the heart. Well, the heart's muscle. a very fancy organ. <laughs> yeah. And um, it does really three things. It, it pumps, and when it pumps, it squeezes blood into your lungs to get oxygen, into right. the blood vessels of the lungs so that they can bring oxygen back. And then it squeezes blood out your aorta that gives blood flow to your brain, your arms, your liver, right, everywhere. Right, right. Okay, So it pumps and it rests. The resting phase of the heart is actually very important because that's the period of the heart function where filling of blood occur. So you pump it and then you fill and then it. And you have to fill it with then blood, you have, right? And you pump it and then you fill it. And when you fill it, that's when the heart actually uses energy. And that's when the coronary blood flow, the, the blood flow that supplies the heart itself, comes in. Okay. Um, so it's a pump. It's also an electrical organ. People don't realize it, but the heart controls its own beat. And each little muscle cell that contracts to make the whole heart squeeze actually conducts its own electricity. Interesting. Yeah, so that's why... You could some... just turn it in on and off, right? And so, I mean, it's complicated <laughs> how it works. Right, right. Um, but those are the three main major, jobs. Major it job. pumps, it rests, and it provides its own electricity. And now, you need electricity because if you run out of electricity, then your heart completely stops beating, and we call that sudden cardiac death, or you need right. a pacemaker. Right, right. Now, the coronary artery disease doesn't just affect the heart, though. They affect no, so that's... many other things. So explain that because when we think heart disease, we just think, oh, it's a heart problem. But no, we're talking about a coronary artery disease is very, very broad, complex. So that's one of the other myths we have right. is that heart disease affects your heart. Well, yes, it affects your heart in a very cataclysmic way because it causes heart attacks, which are very, you know, interest-provoking and, you sure. know, cause a lot of calamities. But, in fact, heart disease is a blood vessel disease. In fact, if you have heart disease or blocked artery disease, more specifically, it's not localized to your heart. It's in all your of body. your blood vessels. So right. it's in every blood vessel of your body. It's the number one reason for kidney failure. Right. It's the cause of stroke. It's the cause of a reduction in blood flow to the legs, right. um, particularly in smokers and also in diabetics. So it affects every vascular bed in your body. And it is not curable. Coronary artery disease is not curable. It is not curable. And that's the third myth, that heart disease is curable. We, as a medical profession, we've made the treatment of heart disease looks so good yeah. that people really think that when you're wheeling them in for bypass surgery, they're about to be cured. And they're just getting a Band-Aid. I mean, they're getting a Band-Aid, and literally they're getting a bypass because that's what a bypass is. It's just bypassing that the problem. That bad artery, yeah. But it's not Taking replacing all the arteries of your body. So heart disease is certainly not, not curable. Mm -hmm. The only cure for heart disease is prevention. Right. Let's talk about prevention. What, what, what can we do about prevention? Well, since it's not curable, we've been putting all of our interests and, and, and all of our money into treatment. And we've been ignoring a growing problem, yeah. which is how do we prevent it? And it's been estimated that 90% of cardiovascular disease could be eliminated. 
And that just think about 90%. the health repercussions from this, like loss of sick time, work oh, days, huge. medical costs, human suffering by controlling your cardiac risk factors. Now, this is where the Let's rubber hits the, the road. Yeah, the risk factors of cardiovascular disease. Let's go over each one. Hypertension, explain that one. Hypertension is very simple. It's high blood pressure that you measure with a monitor on the arm, the wrist. Easy to measure, and what causes that though? What causes high blood pressure? The honest truth is we don't know. Wow, interesting. If I knew we'd be get you and I, we could go to Stockholm and get our Nobel Prize. Oh, I'd love that. I'd love to go, but I <laughs> prefer to stay here in the winter. But I will say that high blood pressure is ubiquitous, meaning that 60% of 60-year-olds, 70% of 70-year-olds, and so on, have high blood pressure. And you and I sit here and we talk about high blood pressure like it's something easy to measure because, well, we can measure it. Right. But in fact, it's a very difficult thing to measure because what happens? Patients come to me and they say, well, I don't have high blood pressure. I only have high blood pressure when you check my blood pressure. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Which means that you have high blood pressure, but you don't believe it. You right. don't own the problem. Right. Okay? And so what I do now is there's, I have a few little tricks that I do to convince people that they really do have high blood pressure because, well, I can measure it, but they're not, they may not trust me. They right. may say it's the white coat or right. it's only because I'm nervous. Right. But you know what? If you're nervous, you're not just nervous with the doctor. You're nervous when you're driving the car or you're angry. Right. The blood pressure in general is labile. It moves around. Okay. So what you want your blood pressure to be moving around is a lower mean number. Okay. Okay. So normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. All right. Okay. Not 140 over 90. You know. So that's kind of where you want it to. You to want it as low as you can get it. And what you really need to do is have the patient, or your friend, or your colleague, measure it randomly at home and make a diary. Okay. Because when they see the numbers repetitively too high, then, then they're going to understand they've got a problem. Hyperchlorous. I'll let you say that. It's high cholesterol. Hypercholesterolemia. Thank you. High, <laughs> high cholesterol. What causes that? And, you know, that is one of the major, major. risk factors. Major risk factor. Um, we discovered this in the 60s, and um, we've discovered many more things about cholesterol. But too much cholesterol is the beginning stage of artery disease. Bad lipids invade the artery wall and set up shop and make plaques. Plaques subsequently rupture, clots form on the ruptured plaque, and that's a stroke or a heart attack. Right. Tobacco use. We have all heard about that one. That's just a given. So tobacco use inflames the artery wall. There you go. It inflames the wall. It triggers those plaques that are sitting there waiting to get you it triggers the plaque to rupture. When okay. it ruptures like a volcano, your blood goes rushing past it, it sees the ruptured traffic jam, creates a clot, and calls for more of its clotting friends to join the party. Mm -mm. Diabetes. The epidemic in Texas. It's the beginning. Um, so diabetes affects, at this point, about depends on which population you look, but life, exp life tables for a white or a Caucasian person, about a third of white people will develop diabetes in their life. Black people, 40% of them, and Pretty anybody high. of Hispanic heritage and genetics, half of the time will develop diabetes. 50% 50 50 of the time. High. And, and that... diabetes is not a sugar disease. People think diabetes is a problem with their sugar. It's much more than a sugar disease. We could do a whole hour on diabetes, and, um, but it affects all your blood vessels. So in fact, diabetics almost always die of cardiovascular disease. So it's in my world, half of our patients, half of the cardiovascular patients have diabetes. Here's another epidemic, obesity. Obesity, well, it's hard to tether obesity away from diabetes, it's and it's also hard to, hard to pull um, obesity away from hypertension. 
So in fact, the cardiac risk factors, they overlap and cluster to increase the risk in the susceptible population. So overweight people have high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol. Because they're overweight, they tend to be more sedentary. They obviously eat more than they should if they're overweight. And that's how the, the risk factors of heart disease cluster in those groups. And that's the last one is a sedentary life, lifestyle, and we know that that's, that's definitely it a It certainly affects it. Even if you took, and this is hard to do, because like we said, it's hard to measure accurately your blood pressure control. Well, it's very difficult to measure how much activity someone gets. Do you know why? Because they don't tell the truth. They say, <laughs> they do, they say, I run four days a week. And, you know, then you find out, well, it, comes, it becomes apparent through other testing that, well, they only slowly walk or, yeah. you know. And really the goals for cardiovascular prevention are to get 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise. Let's talk about, is angina different from coronary artery disease? Well, angina, angina is a fancy word that's a symptom of coronary disease. Okay. So, in fact... Angina is the pain, like chest pain. Yeah, okay. so it's the symptom. It's what you feel when you don't get enough blood flow to your muscle. This is very important because a lot of people, and you, you, get, you get stuff on the Internet about, you know, what happens when you have a heart attack. So let's talk about the, the, the warning signs of a heart attack and what you should do if you're alone or with somebody. Obviously, call 911. We know that. But, I mean... There's, we, you hear all kinds of things about, well, if you have, have a heart attack, this is what you got to do, like breathe or whatever. So let's start with the first sign of a heart attack, persistent chest pain. Okay. So the first most important thing is to know what risk group you're in. Okay. okay? So people that are at high risk and have chest pain are a different group than people that are at low risk and right. have chest pain. So, in mm -hmm. fact, the first thing I do when I see a patient or I talk to someone on the phone is I'm trying to get a baseline assessment of which risk group are they in. So the first thing I ask people, and this is what really people need to know, is what risk group am I in at this age? So at the age of 50, 39% of women will develop heart disease in their lifetime. 54% of men. That's Remember, they high. just live shorter than right. women. Okay, so... You're high risk if you have diabetes. Automatically, being diabetic puts you at high risk. Number two, you're high risk if you already have established vascular disease, meaning you've already had a stroke or you've already had some heart procedure or someone's told you you have a blocked artery in your heart, you've had bypass surgery or a right. stent. Mm -hmm. If you're in that group and you're having chest discomfort, you better go to the then emergency. you just at baseline, if you're having symptoms of chest pain at rest, okay, that are associated with any of these other symptoms, you need to get checked out and you really probably ought to call right. 911 mm -hmm. if the pain is significant. Now remember that the duration of the pain tells us something and how severe it is tells me less. Okay? okay, because you may be having a huge heart attack and you may not have severe pain. Right, right. Patients tell us all the time, doctor, it's not pain. It's just a pressure. Pressure, okay. Or okay. it's just a dullness. But it's associated with other symptoms, like shortness of breath. Right. That was my next question, shortness of breath, severe so shortness shor of breath. So shortness of breath associated with chest pain is usually something significant. Um, if it's associated with sweatiness or nausea, we're That's just worse. increasing the risk that you've okay. got something very serious. serious. Fainting, that's another... Well, if you risk. faint in the setting of all these other symptoms, we're going to assume... That is an electrically unstable situation. situation. Right. In fact, the other night at Texas Heart Institute, we had two heart attack patients at the same time in the ER. And there was one team of doctors. I mean, one team. Right. And we were preparing to take the patient to the cath lab. And we hadn't really honestly decided which one was going first. Right. And then the woman, who it was a man and a woman, the woman arrested in the ER, so she got to go treatment first. earlier. Right, right. You have to, you have yeah. to work very quickly. But women are at greater at risk of electrical instability 
during a heart attack and are at greater risk of sudden death. Interesting. What sort of symptoms do we need to know? Uh, do, do we need to talk to doctors or nurses about if, you know, if we're kind of not paying attention and this is probably not as serious as heart attack symptoms, but let's go over these. Increasing shortness of breath, that's throughout time. Right. Now, shortness of breath is a symptom that can be due to many things. It can be due to asthma. It can be due to we just gain Sleep weight. Sleep apnea. We gain weight and we're deconditioned. Mm -hmm. It can be related to sleep apnea, which is definitely related to increasing weight. Right. Um, it can be related to clots in the lungs. Okay. So shortness of breath in and of itself says something, but it doesn't necessarily say what the answer is, right. but it certainly should be investigated. Should, should be investigated. Especially if the symptoms are changing. Frequent awakenings due to shortness of breath. Well, if you can't lay down in bed flat, because you're more short of breath, it may be an indication that you have symptoms of heart failure. Oh, okay. Okay, so fluid in the lungs, and when you lay down, gravity's not working in your favor anymore, and the fluid spreads out and impairs a greater ability, the gr a greater proportion of the lung to do its job. It's a sign of something really significant. Right. Needing more pillows to sleep comfortably. Back That's to the, the same, same issue. Thing. Same issue, okay. It's heart failure. Rapid heart rate or worsening palpitations. Now, palpitations goes to that whole electrical thing. Okay. okay. Now, your electrical system may be erratic just because you have a short circuit. And we see that all the time in, in even young people. Um, children, in fact, pregnant women. I mean, there are other things that cause you to go out of rhythm. And, and most importantly, as we get older, there's a nuisance kind of heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation that's right. very much on the rise. Right. And probably 10% of Americans over 75 at one point in their life have atrial fibrillation. Interesting. But it's all a manifestation of another problem. Right, a much deeper problem. Yes. Um, other signs that you need to discuss, certain symptoms that are also related, uh, rapid weight gain. Well, well <laughs> that's, a, that's a hot topic, but if you rapidly gain weight, and when we say rapidly, like over a couple of week period, it, and I had a patient very recently who was admitted on Christmas Day, and um, she had rapid get weight gain. And she was a very slight woman, um, probably weighed 120 pounds at baseline, right. and she gained 20 pounds. Yeah, so okay, now it was something. water weight. Okay. But she had a very weak heart. Okay, so she knew she had the heart problem, and she slowly let it get. And she was busy preparing for the Christmas season. Right, She right. ignored herself. And finally, on Christmas Day, she could no longer breathe well. Got admitted for a two-day respite, and we sucked the fluid off, All and right. she was better. But rapid weight gain can be a sign of a failing heart. Pain in the abdomen. Pain in the abdomen, you know, that can be many That's things as well, but um, can be a sign of, you know, um, increasing pain tension from fluid overload, but it can also be a sign of blocked arteries to okay. an organ in the, in, the, in the gut, the bowel. Okay, increased fatigue. Well, we all have that, don't we, in America? Oh gosh, it's like the number it. one. It's more about adrenals, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so um, if the heart function is declining um, in a cardiomyopathy or someone with heart failure, or I had a woman that was admitted um, over the weekend and she was out of rhythm. You know, her heart rate was way too fast, her heart function declined, and her main symptom was she was just tired. She didn't feel well. Worsening cough? Now, cough itself is a good one because cough means that you've either got something irritating your bronchus, something in your lung, which could be water. Okay. And so fluid in the lungs is definitely a sign of heart disease. We gotta check all these out, but what are the three most important things you would say that we need to remember about heart disease? Well, heart okay. disease affects women more than men. It's certainly not curable. It is certainly preventable. And we really need to get everyone in America to know at what risk they're at so that they can identify their risks and actively change their lifestyle or manage their risks properly, control their blood pressure, when, sh when should we get checked and, and, and why and how? Well, there's a great um, need for regular 
you know, general doctor checkups after the age of 50, 50. Okay. particularly in women, because that's the age at which most women go through menopause. And that's when the risk factors for heart disease, hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes, they all increase after menopause in women. And so those risk factors need to be very well um, modified and addressed. How do you know you're living smart? Well, I run every day. Oh my God, how many miles do you run? Well, some days I'm in a big hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, And right? so, I mean, I try to run at least two and a half miles. And I mean, I really only get to it, you know, four or five days of the week. But those are the days of the week that I feel the best. And what else? Running and... So I, I, my hips are still good. They're gonna play out <laughs> on me, I'm afraid, one day. And then I eat healthy. and. Um, I, I, really, the most important thing about eating is everybody asks me all the time about diet. And the only diet that matters is the diet where you eat less food. That's right. I mean, <laughs> Thank you. you know, Thank you it's much. just about eating properly. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephanie Coulter, for joining us. We My really pleasure. appreciate having you here. And to learn more about heart disease prevention, go to our website. There you'll find a complete resource list. You can also email us or call us with your comments at 713 743 85 one, three. And that's our show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Remember to live smart. I'm Patricia Gross. Have a great week. For a transcript of this program, send 695 to the address on your screen. Please include the name of the guest.